Hello. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Yeah? Not to interrupt y'all, but we do have a really great talk to get to. So, um, welcome. Hi, everyone. Yeah, feel free. Come grab a seat. There's a bunch of seats up here. I swear it's fun up here. It's close to the speakers. Woohoo. Um, hi, I'm Michelle. I'm so excited to have y'all here. I'm super excited to partner with Reddit uh, for this awesome event with Feminist AI. I'm so, so stoked to get on the way with that. Um, just a couple quick logistics things. Uh, oh, yeah. Hi, welcome to Reddit. Yeah, so cool. Um, uh, just so that way you kind of know, we're going to do a really quick welcome from like, what is MLUX? Then we're going to move into, uh, Reddit is going to tell us a little bit about all the cool stuff that they do. Then we're going to have us talk by Feminist AI, some members from there, then do a panel with the Feminist AI uh, members. Um, and for that panel, we will be doing tweeted in questions. So if you have your phone, go follow us at at MLUXSF, and that's where you will be tweeting your questions. And I will do my best to live aggregate those questions. It'll be great. Um, and then we will have more social hours. So all those cool new people that you just met, don't worry. Hopefully they'll stick around. You could still talk to them. Um, yeah. So, and if you want the Wi-Fi, ready for the password? Okay. Ready? Yeah. I see a lot of phones coming out. Okay. Um, the Wi-Fi is reddit-guest, and the password is at symbol capital R, Reddit, two exclamation points. Okay. We did it. Good job. Good team. Um, yeah. So, whoop, whoop, whoop. okay. Sorry. I forget where I need to point this. Um, hi, welcome. Um, I am Michelle. <laughs> I'm the organizer and founder of Machine Learning and UX. Um, I am the only one up here speaking on behalf of the organization, but there are a bunch of people who help make this possible, including our steering committee, um, as well as our volunteers. So I wanted to say just a big thank you to all of them. You probably might recognize some of these faces. They might have been like, hi, do you have an Eventbrite ticket downstairs? Um, so yeah, thank you so much to all of our volunteers and leadership committee who make was possible. Um, also, big plug to our volunteers like Bob, who wrote up our an article on our uh, AI for Social Good on Medium. Like, we are always looking for more volunteers like that. Um, uh, 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 um, that's who we are as people. Also, I have some exciting personal slash professional news. Um, I joined an awesome new team. Did you know that Google has an AI UX team? No? Oh my God, right? It's so cool. What? So I'm now a user researcher on the AI UX team. Just put in a shout out for that because they have this amazing resource called the People in AI Guidebook. If you are not familiar, definitely go take a look. Yeah, I see a lot of phones coming out to take pictures. You should take pictures of this. Um, really cool resource of a bunch of examples of like human machine uh, compatibility, uh, design patterns, all that stuff too. So if you're interested in this meetup, I think you might be interested in this guidebook. Um, okay, that's the only plug that I'm gonna do for my new job, but I just think it's a really cool resource. Um, so sweet. Uh, this meetup is also a fellowship project sponsored by the Center for Technology, Society, and Policy and the Algorithmic Fairness and Opacity Working Group. I know, rolls right off the tongue. Um, if this is of interest to you, uh, totally come find me and talk to me. There's a bunch of really cool folks working in the intersection of policy, technology, like what does it mean to make like models that are like explainable and you trust them and stuff too. Um, yeah, and we're actually going to be doing an event in October um, actually at Google. So if you're interested, like keep an eye out on our Twitter. We'll be tweeting about that um, where we showcase a bunch of projects around that. Um, but mostly, I want to say, first and foremost, thank you to Reddit. Isn't this amazing? This is a wonderful space. Can we give them a round of applause? Woo! Um, big shout out to uh, Marcus and Trent. Hi. Thank you, Trent. Thank you for doing all this stuff to make this all possible. Yeah. Thank you, Trent. Um, this is a super superb uh, venue, and the catering was phenomenal, by the way. I assume that you chose it all personally, right? Yep. Thank you, Trent. Thank you. Melon Ball's choice. Um, yeah, but seriously, thank you so much to Reddit for, for hosting us, um, for kind of letting us choose the programming. Uh, we thought that it was just such a natural fit, Reddit being a platform where communities organize and feminist AI being a community itself. We're like, duh, these two should totally go together. So we're super excited to be here, super excited to host this event um, in conjunction with Reddit. Um, but before we get into our actual speaker talk, how many of you, this is your first MLUX meetup? Yeah. 
Oh, there's so many of you. Hi, welcome. Hey, I'm Michelle. Um, great. We're going to do a quick, like, you might be thinking, like, what is machine learning UX? This sounds really cool and interesting. Those things don't typically go together, but I'm into it. Um, so how I typically describe it is how do we use, uh, look at data to use and drive and inform UX design decisions, as well as how do we think about um, how to design experiences that inform the user as to what the model is actually doing, make it more transparent, allow for feedback and control of that model and system. Um, so kind of looking in this intersection of like new and emerging best practices around like machine learning models that are more accessible to everyone. Um, also when I say UX too, for all the folks in the room who might be coming from a different discipline, UX is way more than just visual design. It's all about interaction design, user research, copywriting, voice user interface design, and uh, data too is like, Sorry for all the machine learning people in the room. I just was like, data, it's that. Um, but it could be statistical inference, could be artificial intelligence, could be machine learning. Um, so really thinking about like, how do these two fields come together in really cool ways? Um, like some of these, these are some of my favorite examples. Um, so uh, on the, God, I'm always so bad at this. On the left, <laughs> we have one from Pinterest. Um, and it's a really cool example of like a visual search. So as you're like maybe searching for something, you might be like, oh, pizza. Like I have no idea what they're searching for, by the way, um, where you get like beaches and pizza, but you're like, pizza is the really the one that I want. But instead of going back up to the search bar and researching, you could just receive the search right there. So that's a really cool example of like a machine learning algorithm, computer vision of like what other things look like this. But folded into a pleasant music user experience. Um, some other really cool ones are like the Google keyboard with like the auto completing gifts or Google quick draw auto draw. Um, so these are the types of like examples that we're kind of looking at um, in terms of this discipline. Um, but what do we do here at this meetup? So our vision is really to build a collaborative community bet uh, between uh, UX practitioners, data scientists, and everyone in between. Um, and we aim to organize a, a community fostered around cooperation, um, sorry, creativity and learning across disciplines. The font's really small on that. Um, and really our goal is to create a space to discuss human-centered machine learning and share ideas and resources. So what that actually means is that we host a lot of technical talks like this one that you are attending today, so great job, um, where we, we bring in people who are leaders in the field thinking about like, hey, how do we combine these two fields? Maybe sharing everything from like, hey, I'm a data scientist, this is how I work with a designer to like, I'm a product designer for an AI system or folks like at Feminist AI who are like, we're a cooperative and like, we do all this cool stuff about who gets to design AI systems. Um, we love it. So really bringing in those folks so that way we can learn and take it back to our teams because like this is a new field. No one here is an expert in both machine learning and UX. Um, so how do we like learn from each other and try to understand how to make a future where machine learning models are more accessible to everyone? Um, yeah, we also are really big on community. So I hope that you don't think that this event ends tonight. Like you just made a new friend, hopefully, while you were getting your melon balls. So hopefully you go follow up with them. You go have coffee. You continue talking to them. Like the, all of us in the room can learn from each other. So really hope that you feel inspired to be like, yeah, let's like follow up after. And like, I want to learn more about what you do and whatever other discipline. Um, yeah. So we've been fortunate enough to partner with a lot of really cool organizations. So these are just some of them. This is what our typical events look like. Look, you too can be this happy. We are this happy. Um, so uh, yeah, big shout out to our past sponsors and everything too. Um, we wouldn't be possible without you. And thank you to everyone who's coming back for another event too. Um, and you might've seen us through our meetup.com page. If you didn't, we have a meetup.com page. Um, it's really hard to navigate the search on meetup.com. So I'm just going to give you the URL. It's meetup.com slash MLUXSF. Um, and we do have uh, as well a YouTube channel, which is bit.ly slash MLUX YouTube and a Twitter too, as well as a, a website with like some of our featured talks. So if you're interested in seeing any of our past talks, totally check out our YouTube channel, totally follow us on Twitter too, because we tweet out periodically like, um, like the great article that Bob had written up, like, hey, we have an article written up about this talk and here's the YouTube video. So like we do recaps and stuff like that too about the things that we've learned. So sweet. Um, we also have a Patreon. Hey, you might have noticed this event tonight was free. Um, and we have been really lucky and fortunate to be sponsored through the AFOG and CTSP fellowship. Um, but our fellowship is running out. Yeah. Um, really what we use the, the funds for are for our like meetup.com subscription, MailChimp, website, emails, that kind of stuff, um, which does kind of add up. 
Um, but we are also looking to create a fund to invite speakers who otherwise would not be able to come and speak to us. So um, if you enjoy the type of events that we are hosting, you enjoy the type of talks, consider giving to our Patreon. Um, we would love to have your money and <laughs> your support in helping us uh, invite other speakers who are maybe from outside the Bay Area um, and sharing the cool stuff that they work on. So yeah. And thank you also so much for coming to a free event. So um, also just FYI, we do have a code of conduct. It's up on our website. If you're interested and just by being here, you agree to it. Um, but the biggest thing is that MLUXSF can't happen without you. So uh, are you a data scientist working on cool user experience problems? Are you a UX designer working on cool, innovative AI chatbots and more? We want to hear from you. So if you are working on something cool and you're like, hey, I think that like folks in the room could maybe like learn from some of the stuff like lessons that I've learned. We definitely want to hear from you. It's also super cool to look around the room and see that there's a bunch of past speakers here. So like, thank you past speakers for showing up and sharing your insights and everything too. Hey, what up? Uh, <laughs> uh, also, like, if you are like, hey, I don't necessarily have a talk, but I could sponsor and be a venue, <clears throat> like Reddit, um, or, you know, I would love to, you know, I have a friend who might be interested in this. I would love to just volunteer, like the wonderful volunteers who you met downstairs who greeted you and asked you if you have an Eventbrite ticket. Um, we would love volunteers like that, too. So uh, no MLUX experience required, FYI. So if you're interested in participating in a bunch of different ways, please come see me or email us at humans at MLUXSF.com. Com. So that's it's funny because we're like the human side, it's like humans at MLUXSF. Now you can't forget. Okay, you're welcome. Um, so yeah, come by, say hi, whatever, drop us an email, be like, I like your events. It was great. Awesome. That makes my day. Thank you. Um, sweet. Okay, I think that's all that I have. But because we are really big on community building, guess what we're going to do next? Ugh. An icebreaker. Yay. Okay, so turn to someone who you haven't met. Just introduce your name, why are you here, cool MLUX stuff you've seen. We'll do this for like three minutes.
Howdy, howdy, howdy. Hi. Hey. I don't mean to cut it short. I really love all of the, the great conversations that are happening. Um, can I just say, I really, really appreciate how many people talk with their hands and they get like really passionate about it. There's a lot of people being like, ah, 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 ah. So I'm really hoping that they're talking about how passionate they are about big data. That's probably what it is, big user experience. Um, do you meet someone cool? Yeah? Oh, nice. Oh, good. Okay, we can all go home. This is great. Um, no, but seriously, it brings me so much joy to help connect other cool folks who are working in the field. All of us are working in something tangentially related, and we can all learn from each other. So hope you met someone cool who you're like, yeah, let's go grab coffee after this or tea or whatever you drink. Um, so great. Thank you so much for participating in that. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to our wonderful venue sponsor, Reddit, who's going to tell us a little bit about the cool stuff that they do. All right. Oh, Director of Engineering, Trent Strong. Woo! This one's for you. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. I'm really excited to have everybody here tonight. And uh, yeah, that was some great information in the intro. This is my first MLUX meetup, so I learned a lot. And uh, yeah, generally excited. So how many of you are familiar with Reddit? Can I get a show of hands? Maybe, <laughs> that's what I thought. Uh, even though you are familiar with Reddit, I'm still going to go over and tell you what Reddit is all about. Um, so Reddit is a network of communities, right? We call, internally, we call it the home of conversation on the internet. At least that's our goal, right? Um, I think the thing that differentiates Reddit from say like Facebook or Twitter or anything like that is that we focus on the communities themselves and the conversations and the content. We don't focus as much on, you know, we don't worry about follows and likes and all that sort of stuff. It's upvotes and downvotes and community and governments. Uh, and that's what we think about on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, our mission is to bring community and belonging to everyone, right? We consider community and belonging to be a fundamental human need. And that's the human need that Reddit exists to serve in the first place. By the numbers, we are pretty large. We are the fourth uh, ranked Alexa site in the US and sixth in the world. We have 330 million monthly active users, uh, a million communities, and there are users generating 10.7 million posts per month, 2.8 million comments per day, and 58 million votes per day, right? So it's a lot of data being generated every day. And that's a lot of why I'm interested in the conversation around like the uh, intersection between machine learning and UX is we have to use this data. We have to make, we have to make it easy for users to uh, discover and find relevant communities uh, as well as, you know, recommend posts and all these sorts of things. And we want to make that obvious as to how it works. Uh, we've been growing really, really quickly uh, in the past few years. I mean, when I started at Reddit, there was about 80 engineers. Today, there's 520 people. Yeah. Uh, and this is probably going to be the, one of the last meetups held in this office. We're actually, we'll be moving down to mid-market uh, in, in early next year sometime. So with that, I wanted to say that we are hiring in San Francisco, New York, LA, and Dublin. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in any of the topics uh, that we are talking about tonight, probably would be good to have a conversation with somebody here who works at Reddit. Uh, we have a lot of available positions, a lot of interesting stuff that we're working on. So thanks. Who's next? <laughs> I show of hands, if you work at Reddit, can you raise your hand? How many people? Huh? Huh? Trent, you work at Reddit? Yeah. Um, and I think some more folks are going to be joining us. So if you're interested in those opportunities, definitely seek out those folks. Um, thank you so much again for hosting us. We're super stoked to be here. It also like totally seems like a natural fit to have, sorry, I'll put away my LaCroix for the photos. Okay, there. Power pose. Yeah. Um, seem like a totally natural fit because Reddit, like you had mentioned, organizes communities and feminist, feminist AI is a community and it's growing and it's an awesome movement. And we are so excited to, to introduce some amazing folks who work on the team. So without further ado, we would love to introduce uh, Christine, Jana, Michelle, and Shavish to come up and share the wonderful stuff that they do. Yeah. Hey. It's okay. I have mine. So. <laughs> I'll give you a 10 minute warning. Oh, great. You just 
go straight into the presentation. I can't stand in front of the projector. Yeah. The light is very bright. <laughs> okay. Um, but we're going to present. I mean, this is the presentation. I don't want to sit in front of the projector. Welcome to a collective. <laughs> Okay, awesome. So this is Feminist AI. Um, we have locations in San Francisco and uh, very small and primarily we're based in Los Angeles. Um, we have community members from all over uh, joining uh, around the world. Um, Gadiva actually is, is a friend and, and she was uh, in one of the first actual um, Feminist AI community meeting. So it's really wonderful to see how much uh, it's grown. Um, we started in 2016. Um, and really, just to kind of give you some basic information about Feminist AI, um, initially, conversations and approaches to learning about artificial intelligence um, often come through the product and computer science space. This approach and learning about AI very specifically came from community um, and from theory. So tonight is going to be a little bit different than what you're probably used to. It's not going to be a straight up product presentation. Um, it's more exploratory research. It's more um, artistic and critical research. So just kind of keep that in mind. And if something seems a little bit, you know, quite concept heavy, that's okay. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so we'll just go ahead and... All right. So what we do uh, is we're a community AI research group that uses participatory approaches to engage in critical and social AI projects. Um, we engage in participatory design by creating spaces for co-research design and production with human voices that aren't typically heard in these tech spaces. And so we're currently creating or co-creating hardware and software products, and we're working towards redefining mental health as we know it. <laughs> Our focus this year is on the cultural AI design tool and hardware, along with feelings research and sound research. Um, and then over the next month, we'll be announcing our fall programming. Uh, we work, we'll be working with three nonprofits uh, in Los Angeles and one in Oklahoma. All right, and I just want to quickly go through uh, three disclaimers. <laughs> the first one um, is really, we go by feminist AI, but technically it's more feminist, post-human, queer AI. Um, there's problems with all of these words, right? We know there's problems with the word posthuman. It's not necessarily accessible. Queer is an ideal word. Not all communities understand. So we go and we kind of default to feminist AI because it's something people generally get. We acknowledge the problematic histories of the word, but understand it's the only word we have to work with right now. Um, Another thing is we're going to be talking about inclusivity and diversity. And when we work with communities and talk about this, we're really kind of aware of owning our privilege in this space. Um, so that's kind of a, a really important thing. Um, and we're going to use language that's a little fuzzy. Okay, so when we talk about AI design, we're not talking about designing for optimization. We're looking at optimizing for culture and a lot of these approaches. So just kind of bear with us as we <laughs> embark on this journey together. Um, and then, really, we start by thanking, uh, thanking all of the individuals who've contributed, and, and this is probably needs to be updated again, but, you know, people over the past three years, um, and additionally locations uh, hosting us, um, and we really appreciate the following communities for supporting us in these different ways. Um, so I'm going to actually stand because I feel really uncomfortable with everyone. <laughs> there we go. So... It's lovely to see that individuals from a lot of these locations have, have come and, and gone out of their way to, to help us. Uh, the project that we're presenting, Contextual Normalcy, will be presenting at the Frontier of AI-Assisted Care at Stanford in September. Um, you know, the XR Studio, uh, which is a Mozilla-sponsored pop-up, really kind of has, has helped us along with MLUX, Speculative Futures Communities. So we just really want to say thank you. We really appreciate the community support. And our philosophy is also a very important thing. And this is something that we've developed over the past three years. You can go to our website, feminist.ai, <laughs> philosophy, and you can see the philosophy. But really our focus, you know, is designing with unheard voices, um, being invited to a location to participate, and understanding that all knowledge systems and skills are equally honored and valued. So why are we here? <laughs> 
Over the course of my thesis at Art Center, I came to realize that AI and knowledge production was developed by a very specific demographic. So beginning with these particular bodies, which were heavily influenced by both industry and academia, um, it really kind of had an effect of prioritizing specific type of knowledge and approaches to thinking about AI, um, oftentimes focusing on, on products. Um, and here we see these problem-driven solutions and problem solution, pardon me, <laughs> and current AI products and systems. So here's a quick reminder of some recent socially problematic products that could benefit from these inclusive design approaches. Um, and here, I'm just going to quickly, I, I'm sure you know that Amazon's experimental AI recruiting, um, Kaczynski and Wang's sexual orientation algorithm, uh, Lena, a lot of the image tagging. It, historically, we understand that this is a problematic space, right? So all of these products were reveal that the, there's a human bias in the outputs and effects of AI. So when an algorithm was used to judge a beauty contest, for example, there was a preferencing of lighter skin. So AI both reveals and reinforces the hegemony of Western standards of beauty at the expense of culturally and local specificity, thereby erasing diversity of representation on a global scale. So we're here to talk about the cultural design approach and why it's important. This is the approach that Feminist AI uses, um, and essentially what we're trying to do, <laughs> and you'll have to bear with me, I, I apologize in advance, we have some lovely notes, but they're cut off, <laughs> so you're getting kind of part of the talk, <laughs> but I'll just kind of go, go forward. So if you look at a lot of mainstream approaches in this space, there's a, a focus on this disembodied cognitive, cognitive sensory approach to AI. There's a lack of materiality. There's a focus on quantification and intelligence. The language is focusing on human-centered and for social good. But our approach, and one of the things that we're really trying to highlight, is this idea of embodiment, of lived cultural experiences, of materiality, of knowledge, of looking at the post-human, the post-anthropocene, and participatory approaches. And so what we're going to describe tonight is the cultural AI design approach, specifically with these three entry points. So the first one is the mainstream product approach, and Shivisha is going to be talking about that. Um, the cultural technology arts approach, um, I'll be sharing that, and then the exploratory research, which we'll be presenting in our project, Contextual Normalcy. So our community, Feminist AI, has responded to some of these you know, problems through our making. And here, I think Shavish, um, <laughs> you're next. But uh, we're really looking at this idea of uh, using these design approaches to engage in problem framing, not simply problem solving. The tool also operates as an interface for these multiple interfaces. So when we talk about the design tool later on, we're really trying to connect these creative coding communities and these corporate communities. So it's really kind of a call for multiple individuals to be engaged in part of the process. So think about it this way. If you're trying to learn and understand classification, what does it mean to use the machine learning tool Weckinator created by Dr. Rebecca Fiebrink or uh, Daniel Schiffman's ML5 tool? Um, or Gene Kogan's ML4A, right? You have all of these individuals with these different approaches. Um, and if you're able to kind of zoom out and look at this large kind of meta tool where you can compare classification with the creative coding communities and with the corporate communities, you're able to kind of look at this larger wrapper, right? So you're wrapping culture and ethics and transparency in the very way that we're viewing AI. And so what we're trying to do is create this meta tool <laughs> where people start to contribute and start to co-design um, our AI design tools. Is everyone with me? Cool. <laughs> Bit of a rough start, but we're getting there. <laughs> so right now, there are these high barriers to, to entry really kind of affect um, how people are engaging in AI. So we do a lot of community research. So we go to places, community centers, you know, places where individuals have no programming experience. We work with them. We additionally work with corporations um, where individuals have a significant amount of programming experience. Um, so really kind of the way that we're engaging scales. Um, and then the idea is to really kind of promote the existing tools that are, are, are already there. <laughs> so these are some previous tools. Um, you know, again, Weckinator, Collaboratory, some of these are a bit older, but really kind of making sense of these existing approaches. And these are some of the interfaces over the past couple of years. 
and um, you know it's gone from paper to virtual and now we're moving into hardware so we'll be working with supply frame and some communities um, to kind of develop the hardware approaches which we're very very excited about so here it's a long intro <laughs> I'm waiting to hand over the mic and it's not yet <laughs> um, so this is kind of how we break down our approach and this is what we use with communities so here we're really looking at kind of this general approach to machine learning um, while we use a very broad language so people can start to understand this thinking. And so we're, we're looking at this idea of, of inputs, which can incorporate data. Um, you know, looking at this idea of who created this information, really. We use broad language so people can get it. <laughs> you know, who created the rules? What is the form? What is the material? How does the material of the product actually affect the way you're designing with the code? And that's very interesting. And you'll see that later with the tool Weconator. It's a really ex exciting space to be in. Um, and then looking at the imagined output or the actual output. You might want it to do something, but in reality, it's not quite the case. We're wrapping this in kind of a layer of culture. What is the user's culture? So who are you designing for? Um, and then the perspective, so the creator's bias. Um, again, we're looking at the larger landscape. So when we present our project Contextual Normalcy, we'll be talking a lot about mental health. Um, and we're using this approach to redefine and, and reimagine um, mental health. Here's some examples of some of the community source tools. So what we do is we take the paper toolkit and we work with different locations and we share the data and the rules created from those organizations with other uh, communities as well. So if we're working with the Speculative Futures community in LA, we'll share it with the San Francisco community. So it's a really quick way for people to understand through kind of shared language how to engage in this design. Um, and these are some of the filters that have emerged over the past few years. So, you know, really looking at bias filters, level of autonomy, privacy, time. Um, and we're getting support. <laughs> um, and now I think we're going to go into process. So this is Shavish. Do you just want to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, okay. Yeah. Hello, everybody. I'm Shavish. Uh, I am a, well, I recently joined Amazon. I work as a design technologist there which is basically like a hybrid of design and uh, engineer. And uh, it's been like three years I've been collaborating with Christine on this project, I think ever since her thesis. And it's like super exciting. Um, in this section, okay, sorry, I was just trying to figure that out. Uh, in this section, basically what I'm gonna go for is break down the tool that Christine just introduced. It's a basic framework that we use just to uh, break down a complex nature of whatever we call AI or systems and all those big words. So um, I'm just gonna give you a small reference. Like this is the whole picture or the big chart and I'm gonna break it down point by point. So first what we come to is a brief. So this I have, I'm not that great at giving myself briefs, but this one is actually a relevant because right now, given all the Instagram and the followings and the, and the, and the uh, what I would say, the influential culture we have right now is actually being sort of driven by a lot of algorithms and they have an effect on our society. And this, I think, is a juicy topic to sort of like, uh, I would say, expand on like how much algorithms are affecting our society. So I'm going to use this example as how we break down uh, the tool and how we go from one step to the other. So as you remember from the tool, the first step we think of as an input. So what is an input in our case is basically any data that comes from you or when I think you as a human being towards the machine. So it could be your voice, it could be you screaming at the machine, it could be tapping on the keyboard. Any data stream coming from you to the machine is basically considered as an input. And when we are doing this exercise, and when we are trying to uh, sort of break the system, we are challenging people that, okay, what all kinds of inputs can you think of? You know, not just the traditional voice interface or keyboards, but go beyond. And in this example, I will like expand on how iterations later on actually sort of push the idea of making it more abstract. So in this example, I chose a very standard voice interface. So think of a system where you're giving a voice command and the system understands of what you're speaking and gets a basic idea of the meaning of the 
sentence. The second uh, part is when we ask our users or our participants, sorry, uh, to select or choose an algorithm. Basically, this is the point where the machine has taken the input, understood you, or like getting an image of what you are. So in this case, what I've chosen is an ImageNet. It's a basic AI uh, algorithm or a model that Google developed. And I think now it's been like five years since it's been out. And all it does, it's got like a very good image recognition capabilities. So what I'm kind of going for is like the machine is taking the input of voice. And through that input, it is trying to search for the closest match to the images. The third form is form. So just like input is a stream of data coming from going from you to the machine, the form is the opposite, how we understand a machine. It could be the form of the phone. It could be a virtual space. It could be a VR headset. But how, as a human being, cognitively are we understanding the machine? So this is the space where we, again, ask our participants to think and be a little abstract that how would you want to experience this whole system? And in this case, again, I'm keeping it fairly simple just so that you can follow the example, is Instagram. Like, you put a voice command, the image net searches for the closest match to that in your phone and posts it on the Instagram. And that basically is the output. So throughout this process, what we challenge people to do is ask questions, try to understand like with each step, how does this output fit in the user's culture? How does this experience affect the user who would not be using it? And as we're discussing this, approach or as we're discussing this idea, we put this perspective and culture aspects also, which basically means as the perspective of the person who's making it. So in this case, I'm a male engineer perspective. And I have to acknowledge that if I'm making this tool, there is a bias. There's definitely some bias going to come from me into the tool. At the same time, I have to understand the culture that I'm making it for. So this is a photo sharing culture, Instagram, that we already are familiar with. But at the same time, I need to acknowledge that there is unspoken rules, there are unspoken streams of information that is flowing inside this culture. Lastly, uh, I think what we basically took from the brief is the overall landscape that we are talking about. This is, of course, the influencer landscape, the idea that there are people who are trying to influence gain influence, sorry, gain influence in the society by sharing by, by photo sharing. So this is the system that cohesively binds all these points together and gives us an idea, okay, what we're building towards. So this would be, say, the first iteration. Like you would start here and you would create a system. And what we actually promote or like ask us, the participants to do is create multiple iterations. So in this case, all we ask them is like, okay, now that you have gone through one input, imagine slightly more abstract input. So here, what I've done is basically taken the input of my, of, of my body moving in front of a connect sensor. Like how does my body mo moves? The software or the algorithm that I've used is, I don't know if you've used it, is, uh, it's, uh, it's an algorithm that can make you dance even if you can't. So it's actually pretty cool. It's, uh, so you didn't, I think it's called, so do you think you can dance? Yeah. Just search for that and you'll find that algorithm. So you can move your body abstractly in just random motion and the software will basically translate it, your body motion into some dancer's motion. So I chose this software, or sorry, algorithm. And for the form, like how the user might actually understand this interaction, we, I chose VR. So the same brief has this new meaning, a more abstracted meaning that, okay, now it's not just photo sharing. It's me actually putting my body out. It's me expressing myself through some fake dance to the user. And then when we add this whole idea into the influencer space, we ask the same questions. How is this system actually influencing? How is this system promoting this whole culture? Good, bad, but at least a point of discussion. So once we have these multiple iterations, we ask them to like chug out more iterations so that there is more wild ideas, more abstract ideas. And as we go towards contextual normalcy, you'll get an idea of how abstract we can go. So um, lastly, we ask the community to actually donate or contribute this data to the community. Because the 
core idea of this whole process is to bring the communities and ask them to be involved in the system. It's not just me sitting at my desk and trying to figure out what's the best way to create an interaction for the next social media app. This is the community giving their own data, their own, uh, un uh, their own data, their own uh, understanding of the algorithm and contributing it while making it. So this is transparent. This is, um, how I'd say, ethical and uh, straight from ground roots. And how we understand is like if we have to use a machine learning based on this data, not just the data somebody made in, I don't know, Norway while looking for Uber drivers, but this is the data which is there in the community. This is the data that they contributed, they accepted, and they want to participate towards. And then you train that algorithm on this data. It's a more real representation of what the community wants. So, uh, Christine, I think that's your back. This is much better, thank you. I think we have some seats here now, so. If you want to, <laughs> it's a little awkward. Um, thank you. Um, so what I'm going to show you right now is uh, an example of this tool used with one of the students from CalArts. Um, and her name is Sarah Sethi. Um, and what she did was she created a glove. Um, and she created different versions of this glove, but uh, it's, a, it's a glove that actually plays music. Um, and we're going to go through and just really kind of quickly talk about how she presented and she worked with this tool. So we're showing how it scales across different spaces. So the perspective, um, it, it, as she identified, is that of a performer, a trumpet player, a composer, an improviser, and um, someone who's Japanese-American. Um, the culture is arts, music, sound, um, and she's really looking to work with individuals in the Little Tokyo community, focusing on semantic movement workshops. And the input, um, and so this is where it's really interesting, if you start to look at taking this approach and combining it with existing tools. So if you look at the tool Weconator, which was created by Dr. Rebecca Fiebrink in 2009, um, you can start to see that there's different ways to design and look at how we're designing AI from really an embodied perspective. Um, so the tool itself has these different plugins um, that you're able to use. Um, and what Rebecca, sorry, what Sarah did um, in her research with the input is she actually cycled through the algorithms that were available with that specific tool. So she had the neural networks, um, she had classification um, and dynamic time warping. And so really kind of what options she had really affected the type of information that she could use within the system. And as she worked and using these specific rules and these behaviors, um, she was again able to pr prototype those inputs. And so you'll see it kind of in the example that we, we play um, that She's using uh, her self-trained, her own data um, to kind of create the sounds and the movements and, and, and the behaviors that she wants. And the form itself is really fascinating. So I think this is the exciting part about the tool um, and very specifically how we're separating these digital experiences with these very embodied physical experiences. So she iterated the glove based on the presence of specific algorithms. So the classification was a little bit chunkier, right? Um, the continuous, uh, the neural networks were flowing a little bit. Um, and then dynamic time warping, she, she did different versioning to kind of represent um, how she wanted to perform with the glove. And her imagined output was the glove interface uses the sensor technology to capture this gestural data, such as finger flexing and finger pressure, to offer this extended control and expressivity um, to performers through triggering effects and sound processing. So the output is MIDI data, um, and this can be mapped to Ableton. So these are more uh, creative coding and music focused softwares. And in this project, Sarah's creating music and sound from multiple cultural perspectives. Um, here you can see, here she is getting ready for a performance at Supply Frame. Um, here you can see one of the first versions of the glove, it's called Nami. Um, and here, if it plays, we'll see now. It's not gonna play. Okay, well, if it were to play, <laughs> you would see her uh, moving and, and producing different sounds with different algorithms. 
Um, so we'll have this available, and it's it's on uh, the CalArts AI website. So you can, if you're interested, you can you can see this. Here's some more iterations and versions that she did with the glove. Um, and so within this idea of using these very specific approaches, we're taking these community sourced ideas, and we're really starting to apply them as filters. Um, <laughs> and so, sorry. Uh, I, I think we can probably just move on, but thank you. <laughs> so if, if you look at this, this filter as well, you know, this is the culture filter. So we are talking about culture, but you can take these approaches, these community source approaches, and apply them to different steps of the process. And the tool itself changes based on what you're designing. Um, so very specifically, you know, when we're uh, looking at the landscape, um, we're looking at someone working within diatonal music from a Western perspective, right? She could be working with different types of music across cultures with different, a, a larger, different landscape. Um, and then here, we're looking at kind of this, this bigger picture um, again and how uh, looking at different types of input, training on different types of hands and individuals with different movements um, can affect uh, the instrument and the, the playing itself. And so now we're really excited because we're moving from this kind of paper prototyping physical space to more of this digital space where we're starting to connect um, with hardware um, and additionally other softwares. And what we are doing is we're going to be working with the synth community. And so this is a really, really exciting time. So if, if you look at just kind of like the playfulness and the beauty of modular synths, it's absolutely phenomenal. And if you look at kind of this hesitancy on many kind of community levels for people to get involved in AI, a lot of it is they don't have an embodied physical experience. They don't have a way that they're kind of playing. They don't have those entry points. And we're, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Schneidersladen in Berlin, but it's this great synth house. Um, there's a lot of these synth places around the world. And so we're working with them to kind of co-create um, these very kind of like Euro rack experiences that you can actually put into the larger board. And so now we're going to give you a very specific, concrete example of using this tool with a project called Contextual Normalcy. And we'll be presenting this project at Stanford in about a month um, at Stanford Medicine. So. Um, I'm Jana Thompson. I am actually a data designer at Fjord. So my job is actually machine learning and interaction design is what I do for a living. Um, I've been working with Christine for about a year and a half. I saw her talk at the AI UX spring, like this, let's see, every spring AAAI, which is this large, very academically focused AI organization has a spring symposium at Stanford. And I saw Christine give a talk on a project she'll mention later. And I thought this was so great, I wanna be involved with this. So now I started working with her. And I started working on contextual normalcy, which I love this project. I, um, it's, we call it participatory AI, we've touched on that, but the idea is really that everyone participates. This is ground up AI, not top down. And it's crowdsourced to create Alternative visions of normalcy. What does that mean to actually think about it? We're going to talk about that tonight. And so we use the cultural AI design tool for that as well. Um, so current psychological diagnoses and popular perceptions of mental health are pre premised on Western norms, which were founded on 19th and early 20th century beliefs on gender, race, and sexuality. Not necessarily great. Any, so this is a quote from a book that recently came out. It's called We've Been Too Patient, Voices from Radical Mental Health. I recommend everybody check this book out. Um, they had a book reading at the Bindery and the Hate a few weeks ago. So they talk heavily about normalcy in this book. And this is from the uh, Ford. Any remaking of our current paradigm of care would begin with throwing out the DSM which I'll talk about in a second, with its ludicrous setting of diagnostic boundaries between the normal and the abnormal. The normality that haunts the pages of that manual is not to be found in any world depicted by novelists and playwrights. It is a make-believe normalcy. I, highly, I cannot recommend this book enough. It, it gave so much context when I was speaking with these people. This is the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Um, if you've been to see a therapist or psychologist, psychiatrist, you've probably been subjected to some diagnosis in this book. 
the original ideas of psychology came out of 19th century Austria and Germany. Yeah, um, do you know what else came out of there? <laughs> These are not good things. Um, I have a master's degree in German, so I can tell you, I can go in great detail on this. There have been five iterations of the DSM. It's currently in its fifth edition. I think they're working on the sixth. Uh, females in the original edition, lots of women in this room, you could be diagnosed as hysterical in the first one. If you're gay, you were considered mentally ill by this standard until 1974. If you, have, if you are transgender or you are gender fluid, gender queer, gender non-conforming, you would have been considered mentally ill until the 90s. Yeah, not a great idea. Um, so I think one nice thing about going into depth and contextual normalcy is we talk about, Shavish gave a really nice example about talking about iterations. We talk about all these different approaches we can look at, and we'll talk, Michelle and I will be addressing these, is talking about these different media, behavior, and materials, and XR experiences, how you create them and use them in contextual normalcy. We collect data across realities. We do text in our current iteration. Um, we've done some spatial sorting, which we'll, Michelle will be talking about. I think body data sorting is the coolest thing I've ever heard of personally, and I'm a huge data nerd. Um, I'm actually also doing, the, I plotted some of the machine learning ideas with Shavish, which I will talk about. Uh, and now let's go to Michelle. Um, so just really quickly, um, I am a visual designer. I recently joined Google. Um, my job is to make abstract data look tangible and pretty for everyone to consume. Um, so in our research, we, um, at least for contextual normalcy, really focused on designing feelings as if they were a physical object. There are certain actions that we wanted to apply to um, these emotions and one of the really big questions is how do we even try to do that? Um, this whole idea that you feel one way and even though I can feel that same emotion, it's not the same. So can we really assign like a triangle or a circle or any other solid shape to um, an emotion which is just not tangible? Um, and through our research, we really felt, uh, figured out that if you try to physicalize your feelings, um, there are lots of data points. And so from those data points, we really began to conceptualize that. And um, so really utilizing the cultural AI design tool, we began to really think about what can we plug in and um, how we can explore different models of normalcy, um, especially through the way that was explained earlier. Um, so one of the examples that we um, ended up producing was um, input is community sourced questions, responses, and keywords. And the rules and behavior are an algorithm to find the best algorithm um, in the form of XR, a mobile app, and a physical artifact, WebGL and VR. All of this was done in the perspective of a clinical psychologist um, using cross-border cultures. So that's one of the main things we were really looking into was how I in San Francisco, California feel something and how someone in Moscow, Russia can feel that same thing. Um, maybe in a different form or different context, but it could be the same emotion. And all through the landscape of mental health wellness. Um, yeah. So, okay, this was, so our, uh, our collaborator, Anastasia Victor, could not be here tonight. She's probably on her way to Burning Man, actually. Um, so she was the person who's done a lot of the ideas about XR, which, you know, we are still developing. So is extended reality the right platform? I mean, we think it is. Michelle will talk about, like, designing for feelings, and she's kind of hit on it a little bit you know, physically interacting with your feelings, there are therapeutic methods that do call for like physical, like release of feelings. I mean, it can also just be something like crying, right? Um, 
what's the best approach for testing this? I'm not an expert on this. This is, this is Anastasia's feeling, the field. And, you know, how can we use XR to promote, you know, empathy? Um, look at different forms of therapy. Um, there's some, definitely some uh, problems with XR, which is uh, the, abil the ability to actually access it. Um, most people in the United States, actually, probably most people I can think of, I know in the world, wherever they are in the world, have mobile phones. That's a very good entry point for any kind of interactive design. Um, XR is still very restricted. It still takes a lot of money to have access to it. A friend of mine tweeted the other day, she's a graduate student in art and psychology. She's developing XR in a 10 year old laptop. Um, so it's definitely accessibility is a massive issue with this. I'll hand it back to Michelle. Um, yeah, so uh, for me, once again, visual designing um, was tackled with the question um, that I mentioned very briefly earlier is how do you design a feeling? Um, and so there's like a big list of all of these things that the design needed to touch on. Um, a feeling that you can interact, a feeling that can also be abstract but representative, um, a feeling that has no preconceived um, connotations of what a feeling would be. <laughs> um, so my job wasn't very easy. <laughs> um, but then utilizing data and the things that, you know, like all the information that we had collected, this was the first step to redefining something that had been already defined for a really long time. Um, ultimately, the goal is how do we push away the connotations of emotions and give it a new definition. Um, so we talk about giving physicality to emotion uh, to feeling. And Jana mentioned it very briefly. There are physical things you can do um, to make yourself feel better or to um, represent what you're feeling to other people. You can jump up and down when you're happy, you laugh, you cry, you throw a tantrum. Um, but we needed to collect this data. And so we engaged in field studies and explored feelings as design material. Um, and we did a lot of questions and interviews with people on how they create certain actions to remove their feelings. And we ended up with a lot of throwing <laughs> like you um, throw a tantrum or you throw your hands up in the air when you're happy and there's a lot of these physical movements and that once again boiled down to how do we visualize that in visual design? Oh, sorry. Um, I ultimately came to the conclusion of blobby forms <laughs> because you can you don't, well, okay, sorry, let me backtrack. We began looking at microbes and cells because they are fundamentally what make us alive. And I was really interested in how these cells um, interacted. They kind of like touch each other and then become a bigger thing and then um, evolve into something new. And that became the ultimate foundation of how I started to visualize the data for contextual normalcy. Uh, is there a way? Yeah. Oh, I think it's, yeah. So um, this is a very quick um, demo of what the app looks like. Um, and it, you know, you, you pick a feeling, it gives you a prompt and you, you, um, input your response. And it's different from everyone else's. And I'll, I'll just let it play real fast. You tag your own keywords, which is quite interesting because you're using people to do a lot of the same thing. So maybe it's larger systems that are automated. And this idea of attaching consent is actually quite interesting. Well, um, so this is great. So asking people for every bit of information they donate, they choose how it's used. This is huge. <laughs> and so we're really, really excited about that. And you actually release the feeling and then you can zoom in and see feelings from other people around the world. Um, so, and you can throw the feeling. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot kind of of that embodied, you know, experiential uh, uh, approaches. Um, 
So again, you can see other feelings. <laughs> it's kind of looping through again. Um, and then there's a dash, which we just deactivated for, for this version. Um, but it seems to be just like looping and looping. <laughs> Now, again, we talked about that kind of idea of attaching consent, and I'll hand it back over to you, Michelle. Yeah, so very important to make very clear um, what you're consenting to. Um, one of the main issues we also recognize is that no one reads terms and conditions. Um, I mean, no, yeah, like if you get past the first sentence, congratulations, but <laughs> I ultimately don't know who and what I've sold my soul to. Um, but we wanted to make that very, very clear. Um, when you're donating your data, when you are participating in this, we want to make very clear that you are in full control of your information. And when once all of this is done, you can um, visualize how your data has grown, how it's interacted with other people around the world, and... Um, where it was sourced and where they connect. Um, this is a very not accurate data um, map set of what they would be, but yeah, ultimately you would still want to track your data and watch it grow and watch how you grow and how other people react and maybe feel the same way. And just some really cool screenshots. Um, but as you can see, the very first um, slide on the left, left, um, the emotions are blobs. They are multicolors. They are not assigned to anything. They can, the ultimate goal is that they would change and morph over time based on user input. Uh, so what we see as sleep one day may not be the same uh, two months from now. And so, yeah, I'm going to give it back to Jana. One, one more thing. So we've added a feature now. Um, before, we basically community sourced the questions about feelings with users from around the world, right? So we asked people in different countries. It's not just based in the United States because we're trying to get different thinking about feelings. And very specifically, we have a feature now where you can actually, if you're feeling something, you can contribute and submit your own feelings. So you have the community source feelings and then your own feeling that you can contribute, which is pretty exciting. So um, we are still working on getting enough data to do some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in this section. So please, we will discuss in the end if you want to join. Um, there isn't just one normal. Um, we all know that normal, you know, norms are different from gender to gender, from, you know, country to country, from, you know, San Francisco to San Jose. Actually, I think there's a really nice example I was reading about the other day. I've noticed tonight, people are getting confused. Do I refer to right or left? Um, you know, I was, there's these examples of languages, indigenous languages in Australia, where they use absolute cardinal direction, which would, of course, totally eliminate this. It would be towards the east. I think that's east. Um, or west. It's towards the west. So, you know, it's, it's great to have the idea of a bell curve, but it's not a really good model. I have a mathematics degree, I can tell you it's not a good model. Um, I mean, there's variation by location. This is real data from London. Um, it's, they did this survey, it's called the London Happiness Index. You can see that most of London, east side, is more working class. You know, the outer suburbs, they're all kind of the same. What buys you happiness is not money, it's old money. Kensington and Chelsea are really happy. I just stayed in Kensington and Chelsea a couple months ago. They were pretty happy. Um, you can vary depending on, you know, how you identify. I don't actually agree with even spectrum of gender identity. I think it's way more complicated than that. Um, happiness does vary by age. Typically, you're happiest when they're, you're very young and very old. And when you're middle-aged, you're like, God damn it, <laughs> which is how I feel a lot of days. <laughs> Um, so, Shadish and I discussed a lot of ideas about how we could, like, figure out, like, data and sort the data. And what we came up with is actually sort of a really good illustrative example of contextual normalcy. So this, you know, it's in English right now, but honestly, we'd want to make it multilingual. But being able to look at document similarity for some of these short texts we have 
and see where we can find patterns of normalcy, like different clusters of normal. There's not one normal, there's multiple forms of normal. And also if you are a designer, you're familiar with mindsets, right? Even in the design field, this is like, we're going from personas to mindsets now because personas and demographics stratification are not really great ways of doing design. Looking at similar mindsets is a good, better way of doing design. Still not perfect, but much better. Um, so, you know, current models on language, this is actually from a paper on, I think this is actually from a 2017 paper out of Stanford on uh, X, Y, X, or X, X, she, he. Um, you know, some of them, okay, grandmother, daughters, those are more female identified, brothers, nephew, those are male identified. Why is genius male? You know, I've been dealing with this my entire life. Um, you know, uh, but let's see, what's my favorite one? Beautiful, sassy, sassy. Why am I, when I have an opinion, I'm sassy, but you know, the guy's a genius, whatever. No, thank you. But these, these models are built out of historical language data. Okay, this is, the, this is Google's word to vec model. Um, you know, I'm not saying anything's wrong with Google per se. It's just, this is a standard model and it's pulled out of historical data. These are actually reflecting people's opinions in the real world. So when you build models, you actually, that's one thing you do have to look at is accounting for bias that exists in our society or other societies. Um, this is actually a representation. I, I pulled it out, it's approximate, but these are actually the angle distances from sassy and brilliant to man, woman, which again, gender is not binary, but this is what we have right now as an illustration. A uh, woman is closer to sassy than man, not a surprise man is more brilliant than what, no, no thank you. But you know, these are the things we have to look at and that's why you do need to look in multiple ways at data. You can't just not investigate it. Okay. Come on. There we go. So uh, wrapping up our, our, like a lot of our discussion on contextual normalcy, it's meant to be a 20 plus year project. Um, you know, this is, we need lots of data to make anything usable because uh, you can't survey, like one of the current problems in psychology is you have 20 college students in the control group and 20 in the test group and they're all kind of alike and you know suddenly you've made a major finding now. Um, that's not proper statistics or testing. Uh, mental health norms and definitions change through time. We know this uh, as we can see in the DSM, societal attitudes have changed greatly and uh, we need to make a mutable approach to, to uh, our mental health uh, to therapies and our mental health paradigms. We need to completely throw out, we literally need to throw out that book and start from scratch. And uh, back to Christine. Thank you. So just wrapping up. Thank you all. I'll just, I'll come over here with you. It's very bright. <laughs> So here's some of our projects over the past three and a half years, starting with material voice design in 2016, where we actually changed the uh, pitch of a gendered voice. Um, the XR protests uh, in 2017, where individuals uh, who had no access to protest experiences could log in and remotely participate. Um, you know, AIXR, <laughs> contextual normalcy, decol decolonizing mental health. Um, right now, we're looking at AI embodiment and sound and using location-based learning. Um, so we've been doing some of that prototyping and research with the, the Coral Dev Board. And some of our current projects, again, you saw the cultural AI design tool, um, contextual normalcy, um, and now we're focusing on the hardware and software of the cultural design tool. Um, again, kind of pairing that idea and, and trying to understand how people are thinking about designing AI across industries from individuals who have no experience um, to seasoned developers and pairing that with individuals' philosophies. So instead of saying, hey, here's a pre-existing plug and play approach, um, actually having people to design their own approaches um, and, and really identify what ethical considerations, you know, they think are important as well. This is our philosophy. 
Um, and then again, with contextual normalcy, here's an example of our embodied data sorting that our, our interns did. Um, Carrie Crook, who's at the Brain and Creativity Institute at USC, um, and Justin, um, I forget Justin's last name, what's Justin's last name? Yeah, well, okay, well, <laughs> anyway, Justin, um, and so this is uh, some examples of, of how they're actually taking that question from the app, what do you do when you feel joy? Um, and you're actually saving it through the save and load um, uh, example in, in Unity. So people can go in and actually start to rate their data in a 3D space and think about data in a 3D way, not in just kind of one dimension. Okay. Um, and then again, we're having people distribute their emotions in specific locations. So this is next step for AR. So I know there are those places where we feel very specific things. Um, you know, sometimes there's a grocery store that you can't stand. <laughs> Leaving emotions in specific places so people can get a quick visual and glance at kind of what that space looks like. Um, Anastasia did this mock-up. Um, and we're excited. We're continuing our contextual normalcy sound research. So while we are approaching it from an embodied data uh, sorting perspective from the app, we're also working with Dolores Catherino, um, who developed this thing called polychromatic music. Um, and it really moves beyond this 12 pitch musical language and looks at exploring music with 106 notes per octave. So completely reimagining kind of the sound space. And what we're doing is we're actually having individuals create sounds and have them identify an emotion with that sound. So we're looking at feelings from multiple perspectives. And here's some of our sound research. That's Stefan in the studio who's pairing <laughs> sound and video. Um, and again, looking at that localized machine learning system, uh, we're actually using the, the Coral Dev Board um, and real-time video to play musical spaces with object recognition. Here's some of our prototyping. Uh, we also kind of share our work in art and design spaces. Uh, one of our projects was in a, a gallery. <laughs> Um, and then we have a residency. I'm not sure that you can necessarily see this, but Dana Iches is, is, is a resident here with some an individual uh, as well, a community member who works at Inner City Arts. Um, and they're working on movement-based research with this kind of glittery ball. <laughs> so tracking different approaches. So this is more of the art and design research, right? Um, yes, yeah, so, sorry. It's a little fast here. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll hand this over to Jana actually. Um, and this is more of our, our call for information via Reddit. Yeah, it's okay. This is a little funny. I talked to Trent about this earlier. Um, we did want to make a Reddit community. We would love to have everyone join us and work and donate to the culture, like donate to create a uh, contextual normalcy, contribute data, please share widely. Um, also to work with us on the cultural design tool, like help us make it better. It's meant to be a community effort. It's not meant to be one individual's goal. Um, I put a couple posts up there. Um, you know, the idea of community, uh, none of us had, a, none of the four of us had a Reddit account with enough good karma to actually make a subreddit, which I find pretty, pretty funny. Um, I contacted a friend in Georgia who had a popular post one day and he made it for us, which was very great. Um, you know, that's the power of community. Like, I mean, I, I t contacted him on Facebook at like 11 p.m. Um, so, you know, please come and join us. Look at the community, contribute. I mean, if you just want to start a discussion, please do. Um, you know, we have like this rules, like well, the same as this meetup, be respectful. You know, don't misbehave, I'm the mod. And you can ask my coworkers how I enforce discipline or my child. Um, so, okay, yeah, she already talked about this. Uh, we work with everyone, academics, corporations, you know, someone who's just a, you know, I don't know, someone who's a school teacher by day but wants to think about more widely on AI. I mean, actually, school teachers are great. Um, hardware developers, please, we're interested. Donate your, uh, we have the links. Uh, Christine shared them earlier. You can see them. I shared them tonight in the Feminist AI re subreddit. Um, you know, email us. Uh, I think our contact info might be, it is on the, re it's in the, sub yeah, it's in the subreddit. And if you work for a corporation, uh, you know, come in and have us do a workshop on the cultural AI design tool. I think, you know, this is 
working at a design shop and it's like, here's a workshop for this and here's a workshop for that. Everyone wants AI everything these days. And that's really great, except you don't always want top-down AI. You really, yeah, sometimes. There's the occasional thing. Financial regulations, not really anything to do with culture. But um, pretty much every other AI space I've worked in, uh, you want some cultural perspective on this. You don't just want one, the perspective of software engineers in San Francisco. Speaking as a former software now designer in San Francisco, I don't want to, I would not want the world to be like me. That would not be good. Um, donate money or time, please. Um, we all volunteer our time on this project. Christine volunteers all of her time, basically. And so we could definitely use money. We could use money to support the studio in Los Angeles. We can definitely use anyone's time. There's always more than enough work to go around or help create more work and do it. That sounds great. Thank you. Oh my gosh. Thank you all so much. Was that amazing or what? I don't know about you all, but like, yeah, right? <laughs> um, like personally from the bottom of my heart as another human, I am so inspired by all the work that you all do. And so just thank you so much for sharing it with our community. And I'm sure there's a couple other people who in this room who were also touched by it. So thank you. Thank you for all the cool stuff you do. Um, so, okay. Uh, oh yeah. Well, uh, okay. Do you guys want to rearrange the chairs while we like, uh, I think it's probably fine. Uh, cause then you guys aren't in the light. Yeah. We're all blinded by this. Yeah, so get the mic back. Uh, I think, yes, we do. Um, uh, for just a little bit. That's eh, fine. We could stay like this. People know where we are. Hi, I'm Michelle. Um, so some of our goals for inviting feminist AI um, today, specifically um, one of our, our key goals at MLUX is really to share best practices that we can take back to our team. Like I am really hoping that some folks in this room are like so stoked that they go to their team stand up and instead of reporting on like their current project status, they're like, oh my God, but I saw this really cool talk and I have to talk about it. It's so cool. Um, and really hoping that there's like some cool things that you're, you go back and you share with some other folks. Um, also, we really wanted to invite you all because I think you do a great job about asking questions around like, who gets to design an AI? <laughs> How do we make sure that our AI systems are designed for everyone, by everyone? Um, learning the unique approaches that you all take too and how we as practitioners in the field, Jana, like as you mentioned, there's a bunch of us in the field and like how do we think about taking back the cool stuff that you all work on and like actually embody it in our practice? Um, and as I had mentioned, we're going to be doing questions a little bit differently. So we have a couple pre-prepared questions. I'm sure you all have some like burning questions too. Um, you will be tweeting your questions at MLUXSF. Da, 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 da. Look, it's us. Ha. Huh. Um, so hi, I'm Michelle. Um, I think we all did intros, but maybe we could do a round of intros again really quickly. But um, these are all of us and our Twitter handles. Um, but in order to get your question to be reviewed, please check out or tweet at MLUXSF. Um, also, I wanna say big props to the folks who donated to Patreon during that talk too, uh, but don't just donate to our Patreon, there's other Patreons as well. Um, so, okay, uh, do y'all wanna just do a quick intro and I'll pull up the questions? Hi, who are you? Hi, I'm also Michelle. We're sitting in a Michelle sandwich. Um, I am a... <laughs> Graphic designer by trade. Um, actually, that's pretty much all I do. Um, I'm a designer and I work at Google on Android UX. Um, so I'm Jana. I work at Fjord, as I mentioned previously, which is a d corporate design studio. Um, Fjord's great, actually. I really, at least Fjord SF is really great. Um, I am a data designer, which means I am a data scientist with a heavy background in AI in machine learning who came to work in a design firm. I also have an anthropology degree and practical experience in linguistic ethnography. So this is actually a really great fit for me. Hi again, uh, I'm Shavish and I'm a design technologist. I recently joined Amazon and uh, I have a back, in a previous life I worked as an electrical engineer. Then I moved into design and specifically interaction design and uh, Basically, Christine and I went to school together, so 
I was uh, that's how I <laughs> got into this whole uh, research. Kind of blew my mind at that point, but yeah. Hey, I'm Christine. Um, part of Feminist AI. Um, I have a background in clinical psychology, um, and uh, yeah, just do community AI focused work. Awesome. Thank you for that again. Um, so, and like I mentioned, thank you all so much for taking your time and energy to put all this together and share it with us. Um, so we do have a couple of warm up questions and stuff too, and then be sure that you all are tweeting at MLUXSF. Um, so the qu first question I have for you, um, there's definitely like a rise in, I'm seeing like responsible AI and like ethical AI. Um, I would just love to get your opinion about like, what do you think the outcome might be? Or like, what do you speculate the futures are with this rise of like everyone being like, yeah, ethical AI. Yeah, yeah. Because I feel like y'all are kind of in the thick of it. All right. So as aforementioned, I work at a large corporation. Fjord is part of Accenture, which is like one of the largest consulting firms in the world. Um, my previous job, I was working in the AI labs at Accenture. Um, so most companies now, IBM, Google, Amazon, Accenture itself as well, all have these responsible and ethical AI programs. I have insight into the one at Accenture, actually. It's based here in San Francisco. I think the woman who's in charge of it is great. I think she is brilliant, but sometimes I wonder how much, uh, you know, sometimes I wonder how much gets compromised in the name of capitalism and making money. Um, I know that we definitely have a good tool. It's very thorough. I've read it. It's, you, it, you know, if you followed everything in it, you could not, you could possibly make something unethical, but, you know, humans are, humans are, are. Um, I think corporations are still going to be, they're still going to make money at the end of the day. Um, I know startups can be different, but not to insult people who here work at Google, their motto was don't be evil. Okay, I remember when they started, I was like amazed by Google. I wanted to work at Google when I was like 22. Um, and then I see what goes on now and I'm just like, oh, no, 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 no. Even though I work at probably just as, you know, compromised a company. I think it will improve things, but I don't think it's going to make everything perfect. Um, I think one thing that I learned from the whole process while I was like, uh, quite honestly, wrapping my head around like the idea of community, often the starting point usually is just to go out and talk to the community. A lot of the ethics actually just comes out of those conversations where you understand the other person. As I'm designed in a way where I was very happy sitting in front of my computer and just coding there. That's not the right approach. That's how you have close-minded ideas and without even understanding, you do get into what I would say unethical or gray areas. So just go out, talk to the communities, understand them, let them understand you. Often that I think is somewhere like a good ground for starting that conversation at least. Um, so for me, I like to live by just because you can, it doesn't mean you should. <laughs> um, and I think the same thing applies is without ethical AI, um, you're going to end up with a lot of just because you can. Um, and it doesn't mean you should. And I agree with Jenna. I think it's going to help. I don't think it's going to solve everything. But someone has to try and someone has to do it. And so why not try to do something that could eventually help rather than just sit behind your computer and not do anything at all? So as an individual here who does not work for a corporation um, and having kind of uh, had multiple conversations with individuals in corporations and community members, it's kind of a really tricky place to be. I can tell you in some of the conversations, individuals feel that certain bodies are exploited at certain locations in the name of diversity. And that's a huge problem. And if you look at kind of these larger conflicting goals, and again, you know, <laughs> we're in a capitalist system, like it's reality. Um, but looking at, uh, okay, the long-term goals of a company, um, while they might be wonderful individuals working there, 
um, aren't necessarily in the interests of, of helping people, even though the language may indicate that that is the case. So I think this healthy skepticism is, is, is a really kind of important hat to wear. Yeah, I mean, maybe just as like a meta note, I totally agree. And I love the fact that you all are coming at it with like different language as well. Um, Michelle, like what you said really resonates with me of like, somebody once told me like, yeah, okay, it's not the best, but like, what is the alternative? <laughs> and like, as we try to drive towards that future, like trying and striving, but also recognizing and being skeptical is super important. Um, sweet. Uh, I was super inspired by like, all of the amazing projects that you put up there. It felt like a lot. How, uh, or can you share other like feminist AI projects? Where can we like find out more details about that? <laughs> it, it is a lot. So uh, if you go to our website, you can see the projects. We kind of briefly describe them. Um, but right now, again, our focus is contextual normalcy, the sound research and the cultural design tool. So if you're interested, please, please join the community. <laughs> Sweet. And um, the other thing that I would love to hear a little bit more from, especially the three of you, uh, you all work in major tech companies. <laughs> like, how has working on feminist AI contributing impacted your practice? And like, have you do you have like best practices or takeaways that we could also embody in our practice? Working on this project has given me life. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I love my job, but. It's, it's a job, you know, like Android UX, like I can only push stickers and buttons around for so long without wanting to sit in the corner and wonder why I got my degree. <laughs> um, so for me, being a part of this really it make, makes me feel that I am, you know, getting out from behind my computer screen and doing something. And it really offers an opportunity to, one, be a part of something that I'm extremely interested in, um, but also to be an active part of changing something that I don't 100% agree with. Uh, yeah, so you're talking about how much I really do love Fjord SF. Fjord SF is a really great place to work. I mean, not all of our projects are super exciting. Sometimes, you know, they're kind of a run-of-the-mill design project. You know, that's true of any job. Any job has it's like, oof, okay, great, uh, another button or whatever. <laughs> um, the reason I really love working there is I have great coworkers. I have brilliant, amazing, creative coworkers. And we have this, you know, at least within Fjord, we have this very strong commitment to diversity and inclusion and a good sense of humor and a very flexible understanding. I'm a single mom, okay? And, you know, I'm like, well, I've got to stay home today because my kid's sneezing. Um, you know, that is not always true. My last boss actually called my kid uh, the Petri dish. Um, so I think when I, like, I'm at work and we talk about projects, we all come to it with maybe not the same mindset I have exactly, but I feel like what I can bring from working with Christine and Michelle and Shavish and the wider community is, you know, I can tell, like work with people and I'll tell them about the ideas and the things we're working on. And I think I spread that mentality. I actually presented on contextual normalcy at work a few months ago and people were like, that inspired me to be a better designer. And I think it's sort of, I hate the term evangelist personally, like tech evangelist. <laughs> um, but, you know, I guess, evan no, screw it, I'm not going to use evangelism. Um, you know, spreading the word is a good way. And, you know, some of my projects at work can, in I, I gave some advice on a maternity ward project recently, and I was like, number one, stop calling it a mother, you know. Don't assume everyone is female identified when they're giving birth. You know, think about all the different kinds of diversity. And that's what I take into my practice. And I, I get better, and, you know, I have this privileged background. I'm a white cis woman, but I listen. I get better, hopefully. Um, just by the nature of my work, I work a lot with research and researchers. And one thing that I've... Uh, I didn't actively act on it, but it just started happening as I was working on this project is to see research in a different way. Often what I would have is an Excel sheet with some numbers and, <laughs> or, or some, uh, how would I say, a report, but giving more dimensionality to it. Like uh, a lot of the human factors are 
like goes beyond just the question answer, you know? So if you're exploring it, multiple realities, if you're exploring across different uh, languages, these are all credible research points that we miss out. And one of the things that I've been trying to incorporate is like to change my mindset and say that there is more to it what, I, what, what we see right now. So one of the things that's really great <laughs> about having individuals uh, from different backgrounds, specifically we have individuals in the corporate space, uh, a lot of my work is with individuals who aren't in the corporate space. So pardon me, my language gets a little bit awkward. Sometimes we're working with creative coding only or individuals who have no idea what artificial intelligence is and being able to kind of jump in and in, in very specifically how Shavish explained a product example you know, in many places, we're not even there. And so to, to have all of these individuals to be able to carry this research and community to allow this work to scale is huge. Um, and because these individuals and their companies allow them to also participate, not that, you know, you, you have your own free will, but it, it's very meaningful. Uh, it, it's something saying, hey, this is really important work. We're going to support it. And, and these individuals are the ones that are, that are leading this work. Yeah, I absolutely love that and love that you all are sharing it and bringing it back to and trying to embody it because I, I don't know about you all, but like leading by example, I feel like is so important and being like, this is a value of mine and I'm going to incorporate it into my design practice. Um, so I just think that's so cool. Um, I think we're going to go to some of the questions from Twitter, if that's okay. Um, so one of our first questions uh Thanks so much for the great talk. That's how the question starts. Um, what has been the response of the broader tech community to the work that you've been doing? Uh, do you ever get any skepticism or pushback? And if so, how do you respond to it? Yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, it's kind of hard to understand what you mean by pushback. Often you get like a lot of questions that I didn't understand. Why are you using VR in this situation? Yeah. What, what's to do with this kind of a uh, weird representation to mental health? So these are legit inquiries, yeah. which I have met and I try to make them understand as I sometimes, you know, when you're seeing all of this for the first time, you're like, oh my God, there's like a thousand other things going. So I think that's a responsibility on my side that I had to make them understand. I had to make them uh, make the concept simple enough because there are a lot of moving parts. It's not a simple thing, but often that's the excuse we give ourselves that it's too complex, I'm not gonna understand, right? So um, often I try to take that responsibility on myself that if you don't understand, talk to me and I'll try to make it as simple as possible or reach out to the community. There are like thousand other people who might have the same problems as you had and they might have fixed it in some other way, so yeah. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. Let's go to another question. So uh, another question that we have is um, maybe can you share some of the, the benefits of participatory approaches in the design of artificial intelligence? Um, like what have you found that works really well, especially coming from like y'all are in tech too and we have like that's like not necessarily the traditional approach. So like what is a huge value add in using this participatory practice? Feel free to hold the mic too. Like, yeah, I, I guess, I, I mean, it, value is a very strange word. It can mean a moral value. Are you talking about uh, numeric, you know, monetary value? Yeah. Um, well, we know what happens when we don't have participatory AI. We get uh, people of color labeled as gorillas. We get, uh, there's this great book came out this year about, uh, was it, in the, it's about, Bias against women in design. Um, I can't. It's. I can't. I've read this book. Everyone I know seems to reference it, but I can't remember what it's called off the top of my head. You know, crash test dummies are weighted for males, so women are or female identified or even trans men because they're probably lighter are far more likely to die or be seriously injured in a car accident because the world is not. Cars are not designed for us. And most people in our society use cars. So, you know, suddenly when you design something and everybody has a voice, I mean, you know, you can't survey every seven, all seven billion, eight billion people on this planet. But when you actually get a range of diverse viewpoints and people who have a stake in it, 
suddenly you get things that are better. Um, I think Chris, like Christine, might, if you go to the feminist day, she references the intelligent protest. You know, the whole idea of the intelligent protest project was for people who could not necessarily go to protest. You know, I can't usually go to a protest because I don't want to drag my small child into a protest. I also have to work so I can put food in the table and a house for her. Um, and lots of other people can't either. Some people are housebound. Some people, you know, have like, they're, you know, don't like crowds. Actually, I don't like crowds either. So, you know, making something where people can participate is so vital because I think it's one of the key things that's especially wrong in our society these days is that so many people feel they don't have a stake. And so we get a lot of very disturbing behavior. We have mass shootings by people who probably led down, got led down that path partially because they didn't feel, I'm not condoning the behavior, don't get that wrong, but you know, what pushes people down that path? They feel like they, they don't belong. Um, you know, and on the other side of the spectrum, you know, how many friends do I have that are gender nonconforming who've spent so much of their lives thinking they didn't have a voice and nobody looked at them? And we need to change that. And I think this is fundamental to that. And AI is this future we're all pushing towards. So I think having those voices included into this technology that's going to pervade our lives is key to any type of successful future. Also, looking at this kind of from a, a community perspective, um, you know, it, it, it's additionally quite quite interesting um, when people start to understand just like the basics, <laughs> input, output, just really, really simple language, all of a sudden it feels accessible to them. And through that process, you're actually, it, one of the benefits is, is that people are learning and they feel more confident. It's very psychological. And giving people just kind of the confidence through community to say, hey, wait a minute, you can get this. Look at why you need to get this. Look at, look at predictive policing. Look at predatory lending. Look at these practices. This is why you need to know. And specifically, that's actually uh, one of the reasons we're really excited about doing work in, in places like the Midwest that, that's just not on the coast. People can start to say, oh, wait a minute, I, I've got this. It, it's, the conversation is no longer about these robots coming to take over our jobs. It's like, well, wait a minute, how could I use this resource to water my crops more efficiently, right? So, yeah. <laughs> that's awesome. And um, too, like thinking about uh, more examples where you showcase participatory design, I think will only help increase the adoption of like, oh yeah, this is a great practice that everyone should use. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to combine a couple of questions in one. Bear with me, ready? Um, there have been a lot of really awesome projects that you all worked on. It also has sound like uh, you all have worked on a couple of different projects too. Do you have like a favorite moment from all of your experiences working with Feminist AI or a favorite spark of like joy um, that you can remember and share with us? When something works. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not as like terrible sounding as that, but I think honestly, because a lot of the projects are so concept heavy, we don't often get um, immediate reaction to whether or not it would work or whether or not um, it would successfully do what we are hoping it would do. And so in like terms of like contextual normalcy, I was really excited as a designer, one, to see it become an actual app that people were using, um, but two, to actually see um, people using it and it, connecting people the way that we wanted to. So that's always a very really exciting moment. Uh, I don't know. I'm happy when anything works myself too. <laughs> I mean, if you've worked in technology, that aha moment when it works is brilliant. Also, I mean, I, I think my favorite moment actually, kind of ironically, was our first iteration of this talk we gave at South by Southwest this year. And I remember this very happy moment of being with a bar with Shavish and Christine, like really, really late the night before our talk, finishing up our slides. And I think, you know, as Shavish talked about, you spend so much time on your screen, you're just like, Ugh. you know, you're not encouraged. Like part of the joy of making things and doing these workshops and these, you know, working with all these different people, it's like part of it is the joy of community. You know, that's... It's not something we talk about as much. And it's so important to have like organic community. Yeah, just going back to that 
that moment. That was the day that I actually learned how to play pool for the first time. <laughs> uh, I, uh, this, often uh, because all of us are like working and we have our other jobs also, majority of our communication is happening over emails and Skypes. Like I met Michelle today for the first time physically <laughs> before that and also the other Michelle also. Yeah, so uh, that's always like nice to have that you're like, and it feels weird in a good way that, oh, I already know you, but now I'm actually meeting you. Okay, this is how it feels. Uh, so that's always like joyous because you've already known this community or understood this community. And then there's this like almost like a sequel to that feeling like, oh, now you're actually meeting them. So that I think is really nice. Yeah, yeah, it, it just, there's moments, but it, it, there's experiences when you know all of these individuals and they get together and all of a sudden these sparks start, start flying and it goes from, hey, we're working on this project to no, wait a minute, we're starting to change things. We're working on kind of large scale social change. Um, and individuals who didn't feel like they had a say or they could go into more of the concept playful space, all of a sudden, we were talking about this earlier, get that permission to play it's so exciting and to be in a safe place where you can do that, but actually have a, 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 an outcome um, is really, really exciting. So cool. All right. I'm also looking at time. So let's uh, wrap up with a final question. Are you all free to stick around for a little bit after if people have more questions? Okay. For all you who tweeted in and I did not get to your question. FYI. Um, okay. So I always love ending uh, these panels with like a final question. You still, you have like dozens of folks here who work in tech. Uh, what would be one piece of advice or guidance you would leave us with as we go back to our teams, uh, back to reality <laughs> uh, and like of the things that you learned that you would like us to focus on? Um. I think one of the first things or the easiest thing that I can sort of put out a suggestion is uh, creating that community even at your work. Often we are working together with people that do us as software engineer, designer, PM, but just opening it up as a community and bringing that participatory uh, practice just within the group. And my assumption is that that itself will grow outside of work also. You know, it's a, I don't want to use that term, but I can't think of any other, it's a, it has a viral effect. Like you, you, you bring more people, you talk about outside of, did you submit my button or did you finish the ticket and be more interactive with them and create that community. That itself leads into uh, creating that participatory community. Um. I usually have a good community at work. I don't know why. I'm very lucky in that. Um, but I think one thing I'd kind of forgotten about was the joy of playing. You know, because I am a very serious person all the time. I have, a fr I have a friend sitting here who's known me about 20 something years. He can definitely <laughs> know how serious I am. Um, but I'd forgotten sort of the joy of playing and like exploring. And I think I make, I bring so much more to work now and I bounce ideas so much more now. I mean, I, I feel like I hopefully can like inspire other people ideas and they definitely inspire me. And I don't think that existed as much before I was involved with feminist AI. And so I'm incredibly grateful to the community for giving sort of that joy of exploration back to me. Um, so to combo up those two answers, uh, find something that you like and then make the people around you do it with you. Um, but I think for me ultimately is, so in my day-to-day -day work, I don't get to incorporate a lot of this. Um, like I said, I can only push a button so many times, um, but being in an environment with people um, puts me in a space where I know that I can have fun and I can continue pursuing this. Um, in separate projects, um, as well as the one that I have to do for work. So that's always that. So there's, there's a 
takeaway, but I also want to take the time to point out that there are a lot of individuals, of course, that you don't see here who make all of this happen. You know, individuals in Berlin, Stephanie Cedeno, our friend Lee, who's moving up. There's a whole community of people who've really worked on this. And additionally, XR Studio gave us a place to really kind of work on that. And, and there's a lot of support and we'll be doing further iterations with people from XR Studio. Actually, Agnes <laughs> is here from XR Studio um, and really just kind of, you know, having a place to grow and support each other. Um, so I really Really want to just give a shout out to all of the communities MLUX amazing this is wonderful you know the SF meetup group so there's a lot of wonderful uh, wonderful individuals in this space in regards to the takeaway um, again anything community focused anything community oriented really kind of helps uh, thinking approaches playfulness it one of the things if, if you're looking at it kind of an interesting uh, takeaway is is looking at an alternative community that you're not necessarily aware of or maybe even comfortable with <laughs> you know there are a lot of places where we go where I'm like wow <laughs> we are very different in our approach um, let's talk about this like to give you a very specific example we were applying for a grant and an individual um, did not want to be on kind of the grant application process uh, because they didn't want the money from the government to go to the arts. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's a really different mindset than kind of what we're used to. So going to those places that you're really uncomfortable with um, is a really important thing. Yeah. Love it. This was all been so fantastic. And I really just, I, I want to thank you all for your time. And like you mentioned, the community of all the folks who aren't here too, like, thank you all so much. Um, thank you again for taking the time to share all this too. I just have one more slide. I want to thank Reddit as well. Um, and most importantly, thank you to all of our MLUX volunteers and to you for taking the time to come and sit with us. Um, I know that all of us like had a long day at work and now we are just sitting and being talked at some more. So um, I'm going to let you go. Hopefully you get to meet someone else cool. Maybe go grab that coffee or something else. But um, yeah, just thank you. Can we give them one more round of applause? Thank you.